And what I'm interested in is where must we use plastics? And where can we forego plastics specifically? Plastic for preserving some food, certainly. Although we've actually now managed to, and we do this here at Zero, package all food without the need for plastics. There are now biomaterials that can be used, compostable materials that function very, very close to plastic. So the goal here is not absolutist. The goal here is eliminate the single-use plastic where it absolutely makes sense. Yes, less venture money goes to women. And yes, maybe we have to work a little bit harder, but the impetus has to be to do business. And it's is another thing that I talk to women about is you've got to be willing to engage in doing business and you've got to learn to negotiate and you've got to learn to be tough and to be able to walk away from a negotiation and to think about yourself from a position of power, not to think about yourself from a position of weakness. Welcome to Mindful Businesses presented by Sarani and I am your host Vidya Ayer. In our podcast, we bring to you brands that are mindful in their practices and processes. A mindful business adopts and employs sustainable social, economic and environmental practices. In this episode, we have Zuleika Strasner, founder and CEO of Zero Grocery. Zuleika was a Facebooker who moved to Silicon Valley from East London, and she saw the immediate need for a plastic-free grocery service. 91% of the plastics do not get recycled. She wanted to change how people shop for their grocery. She started off by buying curated products in bulk, and delivering them to her customer in a plastic-free packaging. May they be paper bags, glass bottles. She would pick up the glass bottles when she delivered the new filled ones. She raised half a million dollars from venture capitalists within four months. During the pandemic, with its mixed impact on the grocery business and the overall supply chain, Zero Grocery was in an advantageous position. They had on hand, remember, the bulk quantities and they could readily repackage it and send it to their customers. The number of days we had to wait for pasta, for flour, but zero grocery customers faced a maximum of a delay of five days. They have grown beyond their expectations in the pandemic and now offer free two-hour delivery. I asked Suleika, how is she sustainable? What is the impact of her organization on the planet? Welcome, Zaleka. She joins us from San Francisco, California. Hi, Vidya. I'm so glad to have you on my show. It may come as a shock to most Americans, even ones who are conscientious recyclers who recycle and put out, they are recycling out every week, that most municipalities do not accept or recycle plastics. Maybe the plastic grocery bags, the bags that you put your produce in, your cling wraps. We're not even talking about the multi-layer plastics like the candy wraps or the your potato chip bags. Do you have some statistics to share with our listeners? The amount of plastic that the grocery industry, this is post shopping as a consumer we generate. It's very simple. The only two things that you need to really remember is one, most of the plastic you produced comes from the food that you eat. And secondly, 91% of everything you put in recycling, thinking that it's going to be recycled, does not get recycled. That's leaving less than 10%, which actually gets put through the recycling process. Many folks don't realize those items end up still in the landfill, even though you put them in the recycling can. Mm -hmm. And this really was the impetus for a lot of the change that we're making at Zero. This is even before online ordering, right? Oh, for sure. This was, you know, still pre-pandemic, pre-online ordering. I actually don't know where those numbers are holding right now, but if you're looking at data from around 2018, 2019, 91% of everything you put in recycling does not get recycled. Another big issue we faced was China used to accept all of our trash and is no longer accepting our trash in uh, big containers. And so we are lumbered with our own American trash that we need to do something with. And it's coming where all the other trash has gone, the landfill. Plastics 
have received a really bad rap, but they do serve a purpose. They preserve freshness and they prevent cross-contamination, seepage, you know, all kinds. They serve a purpose. Absolutely. And what I'm interested in is where must we use plastics? And where can we forego plastics specifically? For example, medical devices, syringes, we absolutely need plastic for all medical devices. And plastic for preserving some food, certainly. Although we've actually now managed to, and we do this here at Zero, package all food without the need for plastics. There are now biomaterials that can be used, compostable materials that function very, very close to plastic. And they will suffice for the food industry. But where we must absolutely use plastics in things like medical instruments and medical instrumentation, for example. So I'm not advocating to get rid of all single-use plastics. I'm advocating to get rid of single-use plastics where there is an absolute alternative that can be used, either a reusable container, a biodegradable material that functions a lot like plastic, bamboo, paper, cardboard. And we've continued to innovate on this front. So for instance, even in the grocery industry, we have these 20-pound brown paper bags of flour, and they're on a pallet and the pallet needs to be shrink trapped to protect it from moisture. Those are some instances which are sort of unavoidable. Unavoidable. Sometimes we can use ties, and we do use ties on some of our pallets, and there are other pallets which have to be wrapped in shrink wrap. Mm -hmm. But again, that is a trade-off that is acceptable to be made because you're still using far less plastic in the supply chain overall if all you're doing is using shrink wrap to wrap paper bags that are 50-pound bags rather than having plastic both shrink wrapping the pallet and inside of that pallet as well. So the goal here is not absolutist. The goal here is eliminate the single-use plastic where it absolutely makes sense to do so and use plastic for. We must continue to use plastic for. So you grew up in London, UK? I did. I'm British. I grew up in between East London and North London. And what brought you to San Francisco? I schooled in the US for a little while in California and then I returned to the UK and I went to Oxford, not really thinking that I would return back to California and certainly not to Silicon Valley and at the time, you know, I had started working in politics after I left Oxford and I was very interested in education and educational policy, which led me to EdTech. EdTech led me to venture capital in Silicon Valley and venture capital led me to becoming a founder. And I moved in 2016 with little to no experience really in technology. I was part of a Facebook family at the time and really used venture capital as I call it my boot camp or my training ground in around 2016, and which eventually led to me founding my company in 2019. So what was the impetus to starting Zero Grocery? I was working in venture. I was very interested in e-commerce. I was very interested in sustainability, sustainability bets being made in, uh, in e-commerce. And I was interested in this question of what will be the new platform that emerges to satisfy sustainable consumerism in the US. I wasn't really seeing that platform existing, but I wasn't an environmentalist. I wasn't particularly driven by environmental policy, environmental ideals. Mm -hmm. And simultaneously, I went on a honeymoon to the Corn Islands. This is now my infamous backstory, but I, I went to the Corn Islands, which are part of Nicaragua, two very small islands, one a population of 5,000, one a population of 1,000. I was astounded by how much plastic trash there was. So there was this culmination of things that were happening at the exact same time. Truthfully, had I found an existing company of five or six people working on this exact mission, I probably would have joined them, but it didn't exist. So I built it myself. So when did you start Zero Grocery? I started tinkering in 2018. I had spent a little bit of time working in fintech and really January 2018 through to August 2018 was when I was working on the idea. Not a company, not incorporated, not really doing anything, but kind of doing a lot of research and self-serving myself. I was servicing some early kind of customers in those days and I quit my full-time job August 2018 and I set off on the fundraising trail. And so the company actually got incorporated January 2019 and we raised our first $500,000 in January 2019. And that January really was the birth of the company itself. And we just turned three, three years old on the, uh, this January 2022. That was a pretty rapid progress, right? In 2018, you had the seed, which was planted in your head, maybe did some beta testing, had a few customers. And within a few months, you were able to raise half a million dollars. 
Oh, I thought it was extremely slow. <laughs> the time i believed i would raise within six to eight weeks i couldn't understand why it took me four or five months to raise five hundred thousand dollars i came from venture capital i kind of understood the industry i knew a lot of angels i knew a lot of funds i kind of knew and understood this game pretty well i was astounded actually how long it took but yes i had a lot of market research i had some early customers i had some early traction and things move very fast in venture so usually you know especially once you start raising some money and some you know institutional capital comes into the business things really then start to move very fast who was your first customer if you really think back to my first first customer it would be this group of about 136 people it was 2018 it was me and a couple of friends that were helping me and i was servicing them with Oh, a whole array of things, but it was mostly designed for Facebookers because I was living on the peninsula in the Bay Area, California, and I would share my number and they would text me and they would share my number with more Facebookers and they would text me and I would do a whole array of things, mostly grocery delivery, where I would start by giving them plastic groceries and then I would switch them out for plastic free groceries within days or weeks to see if they would uptake the sustainable versions or sustainable options. Now, at the time I was also doing other crazy things like washing windows, cleaning their houses, putting them on weird and bizarre subscriptions. I mean, depending on when you got me, you could have thought this was any type of service at the time. Mm -hmm. But it was all in lieu of really understanding the consumer patterns and consumer behaviors. And these people were extremely patient with me. I annoyed quite a few. I think it was called growth hacking at the time. But generally, it was day by day, week by week, it was really evolving. And I put all my spare time, evenings and weekends into doing this work, which at the time in 2018 was this, like I said, a very underground kind of bizarre text-based service. You almost talked to like a task rabbit service, almost, right? Almost. I had $2,500 to my name and things progressed to the point where I was ordering in 50 pound drums of liquid soap to my apartment so that I could dispense them into bottles and label them such that I could put them into the bags to give to my prospective customers at the time as I was switching them off of a standard plastic pump handheld soap, for example. So at this point I knew, okay, things are taking on a life of their own. I'm going to definitely need a warehouse at this rate. You call them Facebookers. Are they people who worked at Facebook? Yes. I was at the time married to a Facebook engineer. We were a Facebook family. We had moved from London to Menlo Park because of Facebook at that time. And my community around me were other Facebookers and other Facebook families, wives, girlfriends, husbands of Facebookers and Facebookers themselves. And so that really was my immediate community of folks. If you know the peninsula well, you know, as you kind of move down the peninsula, you move from Facebookers to Googlers, Googlers to Applers. Yeah, they really what I was offering. And like I said, it was just text message based. I mean, you would just text me and I would spring. I mean, I had a wait list. I could only service 30 people at a time, but I had 136 on my list. I'm only one woman. And I would go building to building, place to place, house to house with these. I mean, people would text me and say, hey, can you babysit my kids? Are you a PA? Are you an EA? Are you a chef? Are you a, a they asked me to what, clean their windows. I mean, I used to get all kinds of requests coming through the, the, the text lines. So fast forward to 2022, how many products do you carry? We carry about 2,000 products, SKUs, in the store. That fluctuates depending on the season and of various holidays. Sometimes it goes down to about 1,800. Sometimes it goes up to about 2,500. But it's about 2,000 products that we carry at any one different time. And now you definitely are not in your apartment. You have warehouses and maybe multiple warehouses. Multiple warehouses now, indeed. We are servicing two cities, San Francisco and LA, and we have warehouses across both of those, as well as a big facility in the center of California, in Fresno, California. And so it's just been beautiful over these last three years to get to expand and service the state now, not just one city or not just one part of one city. So you talked a little bit about testing your initial, your early adopters by sending them their grocery or their orders in a plastic container, then switching it to plastic free. You were essentially changing their habits. That's really hard. Like even now, grocery stores strongly encourage you to bring reusable bags and maybe 10% go in, even in very conscious 
cities? Well, I kind of forced them to change, to be honest. I would buy them a plastic hand soap pump of a brand that they knew and loved. And then the next week I'd say, oh, by the way, instead of bringing you that hand soap, I brought you this other hand soap. Sometimes they'd know the brand that was inside the jar. Sometimes it would be a whole new product inside of a glass bottle as well. That would give me the understanding of what did they buy us for? Did they buy us for sustainability? Mm -hmm. Did they really care what the product was or did the product just need to meet certain requirements? For example, smell good, not have any chemicals in it, so on and so on and so on. And so very quickly, I was able to gauge that they were very open actually to discovering new products, particularly if those products were of a high quality, if they were organic, if they were handmade, if they were local, very, very willing actually to take up new products or comparable products to what they knew if it meant that the product was more sustainable. And even still today, we have a high degree of discovery ability on our platform, mostly because our customers trust that we've done the work to say, hey, you may not have heard of this soap, but we've done the work for you. Trust us, this is a really great soap brand. And we've done that with Clean Beauty. We've been able to get a lot of our customers to switch to things like deodorants that they would never have used or heard of before, or dental care products, things like silk floss, toothy tabs to brush your teeth with, bamboo toothbrushes. These are products you actually have to discover. And you discover them because you build trust with the brand or the platform that is putting those products in front of you and saying, trust us. They work really well. They're good for the planet. They're good for you. They're good for your kids. Give them a go. Try them out. That's not for everything. There are certain name brands that my customers just want, and I provide them with those name brands. It may be a ketchup brand. It may be chip brands. But there will be chips that you recognize next to the chips that you don't recognize. And normally what we see is that they will uptake the chips that they recognize and then start experimenting with chips that maybe they don't recognize and grow to love those chips. And this is great because new direct-to-consumer, new brands get discovered in this way and get to grow in this way, particularly when they're new brands, local businesses, black founded businesses, or just young businesses in general that get a shot at, you know, making their product the staple for many, many families, particularly when they're better, cleaner and healthier. How did you build this trust? By taking things back, by being very easy to return, money back guarantees? How did you build this trust? So I first started with a membership business. The membership was the cornerstone. It was an extremely white glove service. We started off with in-home grocery delivery, very, very white glove. And with us, you can text us, email us, phone us. You have folks that are based here in the US that will help you and they will help you immediately. We will answer your questions. It's almost a throwback actually in many ways. I missed the service industries of yesteryear that kind of don't exist really in the US anymore, particularly when it comes to your food. Mm -hmm. And so we built that trust by knowing that they knew me, they know my team, they know our founding story, they know how we pick these products. They know that if there's anything wrong, we take it back, we refund, we don't ask questions. We want you to have an exemplary experience. And we also go above and beyond to provide that experience. What we buy us for here is not merely the cost upfront, right? To answer the ticket as quickly as possible, to get the customer off of the call as quickly as possible. You can call my phone lines today and say, hey, I have three zucchinis and pasta. What should I cook? and they will answer those questions for you. That is the level of membership that I built to create this early foundation of a few thousand customers that really loved the product and would tell their friends about it. I mean, I remember in the very early days, personally delivering the groceries, and one of my customers was missing his coffee beans. And I was in San Francisco, and I, had, I was halfway back to Redwood City. If you know, that's about a 45-minute drive at least. So I was 20 minutes out of the city. When I got that call that came through... I rerouted, managed to get that coffee, and I hand-delivered it back to that customer. Why? Because I didn't want him to be without coffee in the morning. But in those very, very early days, especially, you have very few customers. And everything that they say about you matters. Everything that they think about you matters. Every review they write about you online matters. And I tell my team, everything that we do, we've got to put maximum effort into it. We have to really give a damn about the customer, what we're doing for the customer and how we're doing it for the customer. And of course, as you scale, it's not quite the same anymore, but we've never lost that sentiment that we want to provide an unbelievable experience, which we should when we provide the highest quality groceries, organic produce, the best meat, the best fish, the best everything when it comes to the product basis. Therefore, the service must also be the best and thus the trust is also the best. 
How do you select these products? Which are the best? With Rigger, I hired in a merchandising team that have a very mixed set of experiences. Um, I've got folks that were in luxury retail for many, many years, homewares buying, food buying. We live and breathe this stuff. I mean, we taste it, we try it, we trial it, we give it to, we have ambassador groups of customers that will sit at a round table and try these products for us. And customers will also suggest product to us. And then we will go after brands and say, hey, we really love your product. We want your product in our store. So nothing will stop us from getting the right product for the customer. Now, that product not only needs to meet a requirement on quality, it also needs to meet a requirement on packaging. It cannot be majority single-use plastic. So we will not carry plastic bottles of water, for example, majority plastic. But we will carry something with a small plastic top or a zip tie. Again, it's not about being perfect on the plastic pieces. It's about being directionally the best. Mm -hmm. But the brand must be what is best in class for that packaging. So best in class for water is a glass bottle with a metal, aluminium or plastic lid. That I will accept. So they have to meet both requirements and the product inside of the bottle must be best in class as well. It must be the best sparkling water. It must be the best meat. It must be the best fish. That's what my customer demands. And my customer, and I speak of myself when I say this, I think through changes in the market as well, stores were not providing any longer really that level of quality, to be honest. We had seen the changes in Whole Foods through the Amazon acquisition. The farmer's markets are great, but difficult to access can't get everything that you need and the plethora of mainstay american superstores do not service my customer the way that i service my customer so when you buy in bulk do you buy name brands and repackage it a little uh, the early days was very much like that as the company grew the goal was to get the manufacturer repacking their products so there are some products that we pack through our packing facilities. There are some products that are packed by co-packers. There are some products that are packed directly by the manufacturers themselves, or they share co-packers as well. So the whole goal here was to get, let's say you're a chip producer or you're a, I don't know, a cereal producer to say, how can we get you from packing instead of single use plastic into say jars or compostable materials as well. So there's a very complex supply chain with a lot of technologies that enable this to happen. So it depends on who you are, the size and scale that you're at, and which packing option makes the most sense for you. But our genesis certainly was Zero's packing facilities. We still have packing facilities. But really the genesis when we first started was we used to pack everything. I mean, nobody was going to make any change at all to their supply chain. So we had to be the change for them. And we used to say, just get me the largest possible size that you have. 50 pounds, I'll take it. 25 pounds, I'll take it. And we'll, we'll repack it for you or we'll at least get you going. And then we'll take the kiddie wheels off. So you don't have a physical store right now? Never say never, but I don't think we will have a physical store. We may have pop-ups, experiential spaces, but I believe wholly in the power of online everything. And I believed in the power of online grocery and online shopping in general, but food and grocery always lagged behind everything else going online. If you look uh, in terms of online grocery penetration pre-pandemic, we were at 2%. 2% of all groceries sold were sold through online channels. Now you saw something similar in Asia. Asia during the SARS epidemic went from about 2 to 3% to 15% penetration. We, I believe coming out of this pandemic will land at about 10% penetration. So we would have shot light years just in the last two or three years, unfortunately, because of COVID-19 to a much higher degree of penetration of online grocery shopping in this country. From what I understand, you are getting the manufacturers to package it sustainably to your specifications? Some. How do you assure quality to your customers? Is it just the trust that you mentioned? Well, we are fortunate enough to live in the US and have, you know, FDA regulation, whichever facility is packed in, whoever's packing it, whether it's a co-packer, new packer, me, the original manufacturer, I mean, everybody follows through with FDA regulation and there has to be certain requirements that are met. So I think in the early days, maybe this was more of a concern from our customers. You know, you have a new startup. How does this work? I think as the years have gone by, we've obviously built that trust. And we always made it clear that the goal was to get, you know, certified manufacturers just changing their packaging processes, right, in line with their existing protocols. 
and what we call SOP, standard operating procedures. The goal for us is just, can I get you to stop packing in a single use plastic for your granola and start putting it into jars or reusable containers or compostable materials, even if it's just for zero. My hope is you do it on zero, you grow on zero, and that actually becomes a mainstay for you as a brand. And I would love for them to sell that product in as many outlets as possible. The mission, the goal is always to reduce the plastic and to have the best impact on the environment as is possible. So I, of course, am happy if any business can turn around and say, actually, X percentage of what we now sell is no longer in single-use plastic. It's a huge, huge win from our side. So they are branded under zero? Some, I mean, we have catering companies, cloud kitchens, we have those that produce foods that sell down on the platform and they are not branded. And we have others that want their brand to be known. We have others that are new brands that have found success on the platform as well. So that leads me to the question. Before this call, I visualized you having bulk containers, filling out your orders of pulses, of sugar, of flour, of chocolate, nuts, whatever may be in bottles and delivering it to your customers. So in this situation, you could possibly have the nutrition labels and allergens or whatever else you is offered in a packaged scenario is still possible. Some, like I said, some of it gets packaged through my facilities. Some of it gets done through separate other external co-packers. Some gets done by the mouth. It really depends on what the product is, which determines who and where it's going to be packed and how. So say there's an item which you're not able to label. How do I know the nutritional value or the ingredients or the allergens in it or whether it is kosher or not kosher? Everything still has to be labeled. So the product is still coming labeled you know, again, we have to label those products and we have to label them correctly. Now, typically, if you're walking into a store and you're taking from a bulk bin, the regulation is actually slightly different. The bulk bin itself has the labeling on it, but the thing that you are then filling into yourself personally doesn't need to be labeled, right? But the actual bulk bin does. Whereas anything that is being produced or packed in a basically a factory environment or a controlled environment is being packed or repackaged does need to be labeled. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, you know, that product is there. You're not going to get a random product that doesn't have any type of labeling on it. And so what I used to always tell my customers, particularly in the early days, is this is much safer than using bulk stores. In bulk stores, you walk in, that product is exposed to the public. Children put their hands, unfortunately, in those products. I've seen that with my own eyes. Yes, there's a labeling on it, but cross-contamination can happen more easily. Here, everything is happening in controlled environments, right? Even if it's being broken down from larger bulk sizing into smaller bulk sizing, it's it's just part and parcel of packaging processes in, in this country, to be honest. And, you know, we are not a manufacturer. We don't manufacture any products, but, you know, we have honed the art of packing and repacking and understanding packing and repacking in this country. Okay, so now I am a customer. I've paid my $25 a month subscription for delivery. How do I order my grocery, my products at zero? So we don't have the memberships anymore. They used to be $25 a month. As of January 2022, we just got rid of the membership. We got rid of the um, subscription, no delivery fee, no service fee. You simply go to zerogrocery.com and you start shopping. And as soon as you place your order, it will come within two hours. It's either comes in two hours or you get the entire basket for free in LA or SF. I believe right now we're averaging way less than two hours in terms of how quickly the basket is coming to you. Uh, You can also schedule it out. You can say, hey, I don't want it in two hours. I want it. Give it to me later on this evening. But generally, most people are coming, they're shopping immediately, and they're getting it on their doorsteps within two hours. Like I said, no membership fee, no delivery fee, no service fee, just any tip that you would want to add on to your order. And the prices are extremely comparative with a lot of our competitors. Very simple. So fast deliveries are contrary to sustainability and especially since you don't charge any delivery fee or even subscription. To take an extreme scenario, somebody could order a dozen eggs and oops, I forgot I don't have any flour to make my cake. Mm -hmm. They could order that again. So how can this be sustainable? How is it eco-friendly? 
Yeah, we had seen that with the fast grocery movement who do 10 minute or 15 minute delivery. We have a minimum. So the minimum right now is set to, I believe it's $20. There is a minimum basket size, one. So that's the first way we mitigate that. And secondly, online grocery is far more sustainable, actually, than each individual getting into their car, going to the store. We have several reports now that have come out about this. So from a routing and batching perspective, if you have the entire country doing online grocery, it doesn't matter whether it's through me or not, any online grocery company, the process of routing and batching inherently means that the carbon emissions are far, far better because we optimize our routes rather than each individual using that gas to go to the store. So we've kind of sandwiched the two together and said, okay, let's do a minimum order size. Let's do 120 minutes, not 10 minutes. And let's use that routing and batching technology, which then makes us the most sustainable. And we are now the fastest, but most sustainable delivery in this country by a mile. How do you optimize the routing? That is the obvious follow-up question. Routing is, I mean, we're a tech company for mostly, and the routing and batching optimization, you know, took a long time to build. It was custom built. It is custom built for us. And, you know, this is where you rely on computers to spit things out that humans cannot spit out for you. And so we know every really by the minute, actually, what is happening in the business and what needs to be routed when and where. We also minimized our zip codes in moving to same-day delivery so that we could really hone these optimizations before opening up to wider territories. How wide is your territory? In San Francisco and the Bay Area, it covers San Francisco, the city proper, and the East Bay, Oakland and Berkeley. And in LA, it covers pretty much LA metropolitan area proper. Grocery business is a very tough business. The margins are really low. On top of that, you are giving delivery, you are repackaging, you will have to deal with the supply chain of figuring out how much of what to order based on your customer needs. How did you, from the Facebook family, come and are able to run this business successfully? Online grocery is a low margin, high volume business. So volume matters. Now, I won't name names, but I have competitors that churn 50% of their customers after the first order, 75% of their customers after the first order, and who do what we call very, very low average order values, low basket dollar amounts. Loyalty is what really, really matters. Engagement and loyalty. The ones that win in this industry, and this is why I go back to the original white glove service, why I go back to the customer experience. Mm -hmm. We know based on industry standards that we have a customer that outstrips the performance of many of our competitors in terms of how often they shop, how much they spend, how loyal they are to the platform by driving the volume. So as long as you can figure out the economics of where all of those things need to sit, right? These key performance indicators. And you say, okay, I need to be making at least this amount in terms of how often they shop, how much they spend in my store, and I drive volume. That is what generates, and that's the difference. And it's a very, very fine line between being a very, very successful and eventually very profitable company against being a company that is just losing money by the boatload. And there are many, many examples of those in our industry as well. So everybody is trying something kind of different and new. We've always focused on building a sustainable business in and of itself as well. I will always take slightly slower growth, a slightly longer trajectory, the longer game. If it means that I grow sustainably, economically sustainably as a company with a customer that I know is coming, spending, shopping, staying and remaining on my platform, it is very costly usually to acquire customers in general right? Whether you're acquiring them through advertisements, word of mouth, whether you're doing referral codes, whatever you're doing, you're putting some resources into acquiring a customer. We certainly make sure that once we have that customer, we've got to keep that customer. And we got to, the only way we're going to keep that customer is by meeting their needs and expectations. You can't fake it. Your customer will leave. You know, we don't take that. They're not just numbers on a page to us. That's why we go back to the catalog, the quality, the speed, the service, the trust, all of that holistically together is the difference between a business that works and a business that doesn't work. You were about a year old when the lockdowns during the pandemic happened. Barely, right? So how did that impact your business? 
I will tell you, we, so I had raised in January 2019. I launched the beta in June 2019, very small beta. The actual company launched November 2019. So I was months, actually, it really, really months in business before March 2020 hit. COVID is, was a blessing and a curse at the same time. It is, and emotionally, it's bizarre for me too, because it's a weird way to grow a business. It was very uncomfortable in 2020 because we had a need and we were meeting that need in the market. People needed us and we tripled our business overnight, literally tripled our business. And then we 35 X in a year. But there comes a point where we realize this is the reality. This is the world that we live in. People need us and we're doing something really good. We're not frontline healthcare workers. They come above us <laughs> and they're doing the real difficult work out there. But we have a need in society and we're fulfilling that need. And we would have grown, but we would never, ever have grown this much, this rapidly, this fast. Never, if it wasn't for this pandemic. And we've had six big waves, the latest one being, the, unfortunately, the Omicron waves that we've been seeing in December and January. And those have been growth spurts for the company and pushed the company further forward. Mm -hmm. And another big thing was I was saying in the very early days of the pandemic, this is going to last at least a year or two. It's actually lasted longer. And people were telling me, that's ah, a six-week phenomenon. It's a three-month phenomenon. This is I was in it for the long game, unfortunately. I saw what was happening and I believed that we needed to be COVID ready. So we were much quicker than our competitors in terms of COVID protocols. We had COVID protocols February 2020, I brought COVID protocols in in my company. We split as a company. We introduced social distancing. And people were telling me I was crazy in February 2020. By March 2020, the writing was on the wall just four weeks later. So we were very, very quick to move. And the other big piece was the supply chain. Everybody else, if you remember, there was this period in March, April, May 2020, supply chains were decimated. Everybody was working off of basically single-use plastic, things like bags of pasta. Mm -hmm. nobody could get anything. I was working off of a completely different wacky supply chain that I had built off of bulk product that usually was destined for the commercial sector, airlines, hotels, large catering facilities. And suddenly I had product that nobody else could get because I had a different green supply chain. And that meant people could get stuff from me. The slowest I ever was, was five days out for delivery, five days out for delivery, where other companies were, if you remember, there were times, three weeks, you couldn't get a, a grocery delivery. And so we just saw this moment where, you know, there comes a point where you have to either seize the moment or just die. And we seized the moment and we were like, this is our time. This is our moment. And also I remember when we got groceries, we would wash it. There were these YouTube videos of people teaching us how to wash and sanitize our products. We've stopped doing that, but you still exchange bottles. The customers, they leave out their used bottles and you replace them with the bottles which are filled. So do you have to sanitize the bottles? How do you do that? That's additional work, right? Everything goes through a commercial sanitation facility. Again, under all regulation and FDA. But the best way to think about it is that they basically get like washed and hot blasted. It's no different from eating off of a plate, to be honest, at a restaurant or consuming anything that's been through a very, very hot commercial grade dishwasher. Actually, our dishwashers are much bigger than what you would find in a, in a, in a standard restaurant. Mm -hmm. Though this was a concern at the beginning of the pandemic, the more that we learned that it was also, also human to human contact and, you know, at those temperatures, everything dies. And again, being back in factory grade facilities and the correct handling of these vessels and the correct movement of these vessels and the correct refilling of these vessels as well. You know, again, we had many of those practices down at that point point two, fortunately, but I mean, it really is the human to human contact. But we also had to, you know, bring in protocols for our, you know, delivery drivers to not see our customers and to be able to leave the groceries at the door. I mean, you would not think anything before of opening the door and saying hi to your grocery driver. And maybe if you knew them, I don't know, hug them, <laughs> but that's all gone out the window. I mean, you don't have that human human contact in that way anymore. So Zero Grocery provides excellent service. She rates the products for your customers, so customers trust you, you provide sustainable packaging service. How much does this cost compared to shopping at, say, Whole Foods or Kroger? Oh, it costs, but you're also buying a product that is not the products that you find at Kroger or Safeway or Ralph's. If the goal here is to find the cheapest product, I'm not the one for you. That's not where I'm competing. 
but you gotta look like for like a grade A vine tomato at another store versus a grade A vine tomato with me. You know, like for like products, then I am competitive. But if you're just looking at my grade A vine tomato and then the cheapest vine tomato on the market, of course, I don't compete with that. The goal here is not to have the cheapest product. And I'm also putting products in front of you that, you know, are, are a little bit more pricey maybe, but you know, they're handmade, they're locally made, they are better ingredients, they are organic, you know, and, and we build a lot of these things into the fact that you're purchasing, you know, a better grade, a better quality of product. Most people are usually actually surprised by where we are on pricing. We still are very, very competitive on pricing, but the goal here is not to provide you the cheapest stuff in the cheapest, quickest, most efficient way. That isn't the game I am playing per se, then yes, you should go to another store that provides you with a different quality and a different type of product. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking to do a good, solid family shop of good quality products that is reasonably priced with products that maybe you can't get somewhere else or a selection that you can't get somewhere else across things like cheeses, meats, produce, fish, you know, I do, you know, sustainably caught fish from the Bay Area, the very best quality across two companies in the Bay Area that supply fish. You're not going to get that fish at Kroger. So if you want that fish, that's the fish that you come to buy from me and where you know where that fish has come from. If you want the cheapest salmon on the market, I'm not the place to go. I would compare you to buying co-ops 20 years ago. I used to belong to buying co-ops because... I love buying co-ops. Early on in the 90s, yeah, I wanted my kids to have as many organic products as possible. You know, Trader Joe's wasn't mainstream in 1990. I don't remember when they started Whole Foods definitely not in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So at that point in time, we were willing to pay higher prices for that quality product. And we, it wasn't as if we were comparing. You knew the more people that did it, you could bring the price down because of the volume. And so I took a huge amount of inspiration from buying co-ops. What I found with buying co-ops was that they were hugely inefficient. Like you have to do all this work to like get the stuff and figure it out and divide it up. So I took a huge amount of inspiration. Back to community. Community is really, the more people that are like-minded like you trying to do the same things will drive the cost down. And that's why you have the early adopters that do this work early on and say, I can afford to spend more. I can afford to spend $25 a month on a subscription early on. I can afford to have the more white glove service. And the charge that was always made against me was that this was some bougie grocery delivery service. But, you know, when Tesla started, they started with a Roadster that nobody could afford and worked down to a Model 3. And now you have a car and there's the largest car company in the country that beat out Ford. That's the journey that you go on. But, but we have a lot to learn from community-based initiatives of the types that you're talking about in the 70s, 80s, 90s about the power of coming together. Now there are a lot of exciting, um, you know, blockchain initiatives and, and other technologies that are coming to help formalize some of these processes as well, which I'm, I'm very, very excited about. But it's just how do you take the inefficiency out of some of these things? Of, you know, the average mum bringing in bags and bags of pasta and rice and dividing it up into the community. Let me do that. Exactly. And those were volunteer run and uh, highly inefficient in people's garages and or in their backyards. How did you go about getting funding, especially as a woman navigating the Silicon Valley space? Were you handicapped by the fact that you were a woman? No, I don't think so. Yes, less venture money goes to women. And yes, maybe we have to work a little bit harder, but it is what it is. And I think like things are changing and there are now more women founders. You know, this is two sides of the same coin. Women also have to take more risks. Women have to start more companies. Women have to be more bullish about what they want. And on the other side, opportunities have to be provided where they look, I'm a woman, I'm trans, I'm blah, or whatever. But the thing here is that I'm a good founder with a good company and the pipeline and the network is very important and the opportunity. So the two things have to work in tandem together. And so on the one side, I'm talking about change in the industry, but on the other side, I'm talking about women starting businesses, starting companies, being very aggressive about starting those companies and the way that they're starting those companies as well. And us not being bound by thinking about ourselves as any one given thing. 
I'm a founder and I'm a human and I'm a businesswoman actually before I am just a woman or before I am brown or before I am any of these other diversity tropes that get kind of like slapped onto me at the same time. Are we in a good place? It's questionable. I mean, 2% of venture capital goes to women, 0.02% goes to black women. But are we going in the right direction? Sure. And capital should be put into the best companies. It's just that those companies will diversify as time moves on of what are the best companies. And we've been pattern matching for decades at this point now, and I'm not mad at pattern matching. What is pattern matching? Pattern matching meaning that venture capitalists look and say, okay, what works? What generates returns? White guys that dropped out of Stanford that are 23 years old. That's the pattern. Well, yes, because, because that's also what we've historically invested in too, right? And so I'm not mad at that pattern, right? But the pattern itself is slightly changing as well. Again, I think it's a two-sided thing. You need the individual starting companies and you need opportunities ready to invest in those individuals as they're starting. So don't, inv- I always tell, please never invest in me because I'm a woman or because I'm black or because I'm trans. Invest because you believe that this is going to return your fund and this is a really great company. Invest as blindly as possible to who or what I am as a founder. I didn't mean that they should give special privileges or special access to women, but a lot of the investment happens over a drink, you know, going out more easily. And as a woman, when everybody around you is a man, you may not be very comfortable to going off on a vacation with 10 men. And for you to be able to bond and them to understand that Zuleika is this fantastic founder. I somewhat disagree with that point. You know, Sure, are there all male environments, maybe, and environments that is more difficult for women to be in and exist in? But honestly, I think I, I'm pretty good at business. I have great business relationships with men. I actually get afforded more opportunities than men than I do from women, believe it or not, in most of my industry. And I have no problem having a drink with men, being around men, doing what are seen as maybe more traditional male activity. I'm not sure. But I personally haven't felt that. And I rally against, I have no problem with, but I personally don't want to spend my time doing business in women's only spaces, doing what is considered quote women's business. I would actually much rather be drinking a whiskey, playing golf, or I I don't know, with men doing something that supposedly men do. But again, I think it's, we just got to break the whole thing down and say, I'm a human who does business with other human beings. These are my interests. What are your interests? They match or they don't match. And let's just open a lot of that up. But here's the thing. There's a reason why business happens around a drink, alcoholic or non-alcoholic, a discussion, a sport, because actually you're engaging in a pursuit. And I have similarly seen the power of being in a more relaxed environment and being able to have those conversations. That's not to say that there are not problems or issues. That's not what I'm talking about that arise in those. And I'm sure there are many women that have been, who've testified being put in very, very difficult and uncomfortable and oftentimes illegal situations. I don't dispute any of that. But just when I'm talking about myself, that's how I experience the world and how I experience business. And I think why, again, I focused on the business that I'm doing and the work that I'm doing with all kinds of individuals. I don't know, maybe I'm just comfortable in a lot of different environments. And the objective should be, let's make this business work. Yeah. I just need mutual respect. And with 99.999% of people, I feel like I get that, or whether it's at coffee shops or over a drink or playing a sport or taking a walk or being on a Zoom call. But the impetus has to be to do business. And it's is another thing that I talk to women about is you've got to be willing to engage in doing business and you've got to learn to negotiate and you've got to learn to be tough and to be able to walk away from a negotiation and to think about yourself from a position of power not to think about yourself from a position of weakness. Thank you so much, Zuleika. This has been a fantastic conversation with you. Thank you again for coming on Mindful Businesses. Thank you for having me. You're listening to Mindful Businesses, hosted and produced by Vidya Ayer. We'd love to hear from you. Send a voice note with your questions or comments to info at mindfulbusinessespodcast.com. Subscribe, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. If you learned a thing or two from this episode, share it with one friend. We recorded this podcast in Lafayette, Indiana. Theme music was composed by Tatum Gale. Our marketing assistant is Caitlin Milligan. Our advisors are Jim Stone and Anupama Pashricha. This is Vidya Iyer with Mindful Businesses.